Greetings, everyone. I am Mariana, Chief Public Engagement Officer for TCR Holding, and I will be your host for this important live event. Topic of our discussion is prospects of international partnership in the IT industry development. And let me introduce speakers. Andrew Robel, a founding partner of Emerging Europe, leader of the Tech Emerging Europe Advocates community, a part of the Global Tech Advocates Network. Oleg Derluk, Managing Partner, Strong Legal Services. Oleg Malski, Partner, Head of Corporate and M&A, International Trade. Vlada Lyashenko, Managing Partner, CNA International IT. And before we will start, let me make a little introduction. According to the National Bank of Ukraine, the export-oriented IT industry provided 3 billion 179 billion million worth of foreign currency incomes to the Ukrainian economy for the first five months of 2022. At the same time, during the war period from March to May, the volume of export of uh, computer services increased by 6% compared to the same period of the last year and amounted to 1 in 7 billion. According to the latest IT Ukraine survey, 56% uh, uh, of companies expect growth of till three, uh, from five till 13 percentage in uh, 2022. 41% uh, of companies expect to keep exciting volumes at 15 till 100%. It's very important information. In the same time, the IT industry faces many challenges that may turn into risk in the near, near future. Let's discuss about it. For my opinion, the first risk is that foreign customers May not, want, may not want to place orders in a potential danger zone, like is Ukraine now, including from the perspective uh, of information security too. Due to the gap between the dollar exchange rate for the sale of export currency and the real exchange rate, company employees lose income and may consider relocation, including tax relocation to other countries. And third, for my opinion, not the least, but the last one, in the Ukrainian IT industry, 17% of employees are men, and most of them are of military age, so they can be mobilized at any time. Even in case of having orders from customers, they may not be no one to execute them. Let's discuss what we should accept and what must be changed in order to develop the industry. And my question is to Andrew, how does Europe perceive the events in Ukraine now? And how do you personally see the risk that European customers can avoid to order IT services in Ukraine? So Andrew, please. Thank you very much for this question. And also for, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us the recent data from the National Bank of Ukraine. This is really important. And this is something that everyone around the world should actually know about. But uh, referring to your question about how I see and how Europe and not only Europe sees uh, the Ukrainian uh, IT sector, I think uh, the risk uh, related to uh, security and uh, and increasing ex export is definitely not going down. That is uh, something we have to uh, be aware of. And this is related to continuous uncertainty. It is related, just like you said, to privacy issues, to cyber, but also to um, things that perhaps not everyone is aware of, uh, infrastructure, some of the digital infrastructure being taken over uh, by the Russians. We've seen things like that happening as well. At the same time, we see this fatigue uh, that, uh, you know, the, the media uh, have been experiencing, uh, but also uh, the so-called everyday people, that there's been so much about you know, the war in Ukraine that the interest is kind of going down. Uh, I think uh, what we definitely need to look into is what 
uh, buyers of IT services, what investors, and uh, also what GBS advisor, global business services advisors yes. say about what is happening in Ukraine. And here, unfortunately, I don't have good news. Uh, a, a few uh, weeks ago, I had a chance to speak to a very good friend of mine who is a uh, global business uh, services advisor working with clients from around the world. And he told me that in his opinion, the Ukrainian IT sector is, and this is a quote, dead. Uh, I spent over an hour trying to explain to him that the situation is completely different. And I hope I managed to do that. But the thing is that if this is a person who deals with the sector on a daily basis and, and speak, speaks to international investors who, when you look at, at those, are sometimes not only looking at Ukraine and seeing the, the threats, but also more broadly at the Central and Eastern European region and also are, are a bit cautious about what to do in the region. So it's not only in Ukraine that has kind of spread um, towards uh, the rest of the region as well. What I think uh, we have to look at is definitely continuing getting the story straight. Just like you said, you know, the increase uh, in export in uh, the first three months uh, of the war increase, that is something very important to share with the international community. So uh, inviting, because I think that one more important thing that is important, uh, that, that is worth uh, sharing, is that, uh, you know, Ukraine and IT companies might be saying, we are delivering, we are working, uh, we are definitely doing our job, but it is, in my opinion, up to the uh, buyers to also share their experience, the existing buyers, to share their experience with Ukrainian companies and actually say, yes, they are delivering. Because it's always easier to, uh, un to, to believe that someone mm, is doing their job when you hear you know, the client's maybe, perspective. Maybe, maybe we need some information campaign or we need to present well, our success in IT sphere, what we should do. That's correct. And I think that there is a place for, for that. A few months ago, Emerging Europe launched an initiative called Support Digital Ukraine, where we invite those buyers of, in, of uh, IT services from around the world who are using Ukrainian company or who are working with Ukrainian companies to share their experiences um, uh, on, on that page to, 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 to share how the companies are actually delivering. But what is also important here is to raise awareness constantly. And perhaps, of course, you know, we had the situation uh, in Vinitsa uh, uh, today and things like that have to be talked about. But at the same time, we need to shed more light on the economy. And uh, in the recent uh, report by Emerging Europe, uh, the future of IT, uh, we looked at uh, the importance of the IT sector in specific countries and across 23 uh, countries we noticed that Ukraine uh, is a ranked second which means that the IT sector the ICT sector has an important role for the economy which means that that has to be given special attention and that you know relates to a number of different things one of the things is is that we're participating in a legal conference today and uh, we, we need to talk about Dia City, which is an excellent uh, example of, of uh, a legal framework that can help. But there's also things that, and that was also mentioned by you, uh, men uh, you know, are not allowed to leave the country. And we have heard examples of uh, companies uh, that have that information in, in, in their contract. And by that information, I mean, uh, having to uh, carry out all offline meetings with their clients. Right yes. now, they're unable mm -hmm. to, to leave the country. So, so that's one thing. But the other thing is, is, is also uh, residents of, uh, we, we have a stone, uh, sorry, Ukrainian uh, residents here in the UK. And we know that some of them were in Ukraine when the invasion started. Now they are unable to come back to the UK, to their homes, really, because, uh, because of the, of the uh, requirement or the ban, I should say, for um, men to, to leave uh, the country. So I think uh, 
my my suggestion for for the government would definitely be to uh, review the importance of the sector. And we can clearly see that uh, the IT sector has a, an important role in rebuilding the economy going forward and giving it the right uh, significance by pr producing the right regulations that will yes. allow the sector to prosper. Uh, Thank you very like, much. And, and, and the, I, I would like to in interrupt you because you mentioned very, very important thing that we need to share our, uh, our stories, our success stories. That's why uh, it, it could be very good example what we uh, did to, to get success and what we can do in prosper future to get another success too. And the, I would like to uh, address my next question to Oleg Malski. Um, uh, maybe you have your experience uh, because the, uh, it's important to hear your your uh, your thoughts about the observation of the Ukrainian market. What is going on? Horizon, Horizon Capital bought uh, Miratag this year, this year April. So, do you see any prospects for similar deals in the near future? Maybe it can be another success story for Ukraine, which we can also share. Absolutely. Thank you for 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 introduction and. Uh... Uh, touching about those, those important issues. I think that, you know, Ukraine generally is trying to do um, to the most it can to, to, to maximize the exposure and to keep, um, keep basically the uh, investors and clients calm uh, by proving that they can do the job, right? It's not easy, but uh, if we think about it, it will take some time, maybe another couple of months until everybody is comfortable with the fact that despite everything, it still works. Uh, and if you think about Israel and Ukraine and all the comparison, um, all men in Israel do go to army and Israel is also in state of war. Uh, however, it's considered to be an IT world, uh, rather safe and good jurisdiction to invest in. So maybe it's just a matter of time. I think uh, deals like with we, we've seen with Horizon is not an exception and it will continue uh i think that the, the main question is not you are optimist uh, yes i am but uh, i think that generally i think you know my perception is it's not the question of if there should be a deal or how much the deal should be worth uh it's really the question when will the deal happen um and it's also the question of the target uh, not a secret that all the targets that were uh, that got investments in the recent couple of months were really already a global company. So, you know, Horizon Deal, definitely a global company. Uh, Preplay raised um, recently another round of investments, couple of Ukrainian uh, venture, venture funds there as well. Uh, why? Because it's a global company. If you are a global company, if you function in, in uh, many jurisdictions, a couple of dozens, there's always a risk that something will go, will go wrong in one of those jurisdictions. So the question is why, uh, when investors will invest, not really why, because for them, it's, it's what usual. Should be changed? What should be changed in <laughs> this situation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, time will take its, uh, take, take its path. And with time, if clients of IT companies will see that everything still functions because it does, right? Statistics proves it does. Yes. Um, so they will be calm and they will be looking for one of two opportunities. So uh, you would like to buy a company just before the war ends, just when before the war ends, because this will be the, 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 the point in time where the price will be the lowest and the jump will be the highest. It will, it will kick out, kick back to the right valuation. So Just do you right see now there. that price is low for some companies? So you have some yes. customers which yes. can yes. sell. Yes, we see, we see quite a lot of, uh, surprisingly, we see quite a lot of internal uh, consolidation. So we see a couple of companies who had their offices in Kharkiv and Eastern Ukraine basically try, try to consolidate, collude and merge with Western companies who, who had their, their offices basically in Lviv, Ivano uh, Frankivsk, you know, Ushgrod. So Western part for them to be stronger together, and uh, we see some clients actually double checking their list list of uh, clients, right, 
to see who is a relatively um, reliable client or not, and just mix it all together, merge with other companies who have a different client base in a different area, etc. cetera. Uh, the truth is that, you know, as long as you have a long-standing client, as long as you have a uh, international exposure or international product, now, right now it still works. I think uh, in, in Lugano conference, this was very important that, you know, IT and technical transformation was one of the definitely top three uh, areas to, to discuss, invest, and, uh, and basically show. Um, I think it is also true that, that may, many, very many are surprised how advanced Ukrainian IT is and, and advanced IT products are. Um, uh, it is true that many funds right now are getting, you know, are waiting for that moment uh, to understand when the war will be over. Uh, but as soon as there's this feeling it will be over soon, there'll be more and more deals. I know for sure for many friends who sit on the boards of many, uh, you know, funds that they are in a very close contact with Intel. They have regular weekly meetings with former uh, intelligence officers, and they get weekly updates on how, how the war is going um, to make that decision as soon as there is a perception that will end soon. Can, so they, I, somehow, can they somehow influence on them to, to push them to some decision which is uh, useful well, for us? It is very difficult to be true, because if you imagine yourself one of those board members in a, in a big fund, um, and explaining to your investors, uh, you know, limited partners, why you've chosen Ukraine in this particular moment, um, it's, it is a very difficult explanation to give. You know, it is stabilized, it is stable, it hasn't gone down. I, think, I don't think it's dead, right? But uh, the perception may be it's very dangerous. <laughs> it, is, it is still a, a shaky ground. Right. Uh, I think that what we can do is just maximize as much as we can all the uh, all the positive information. That that's for sure. I think that uh, generally Ukraine uh, as a country should uh, really uh, do more uh, to answer the question. So can the IT specialists uh, be mobilized or not? Right. Um, I think it is the risk if too many relocate. Uh, maybe they will not come back because of the families, not because of any let's, other let's, reason. Let's ask, uh, let's ask about this Absolutely. Uh, Vlada, because Vlada, Absolutely. I that's, think... That's uh, what, has... what I wanted to do. So yeah, yes, thank you, thank Absolutely. you. Uh, Vlada, so, so it is question for you. Have your recruiting agency experience and any significant changes in the job market? Because we are all talking about the relocation and that it is really a challenge for Ukrainian IT industry. But uh, what about hiring remote professionals, for example, who already relocated, but would like to work for Ukrainian offices of global companies, of Ukrainian companies? Please. Yeah. Thank you for your question, starting from the impact which our company got uh, due to the war started. So first of all, I might say that starting to, since 2013-14, we have been looking for our clients, not uh, only focusing on Ukrainian market, that's why we do recruitment worldwide, and half of our clients, they're basically from United States, Canada, and uh, European Union. We also expanded our uh, work to such markets as Asia and Africa, which is wasn't expected to be in terms of hiring IT professionals. So we are not really influenced because we have the, the, the diversification of our clients. Definitely, we face the situation that due to war, war which started in Ukraine, like yeah, on the February this year, half of our clients, they do put on hold some of the open position, but it's not that significant. I mean, there are some clients which are thinking about the risk of hiring people, but there is a other huge number of uh, clients who are still continue to hire. And they're actually uh, try to hire candidates for working uh, like from office mode. And it's really weird from my perspective. Um, and on another hand, we do be believe that starting with the pandemia in 2019, like uh, the world has changed and uh, all of the IT specialists, uh, like back in the days, even before the pandemia started, they had this amazing opportunity to work remotely. It's just a question of your self-organization and the way you can manage your communication on a decent level and to deliver the product, uh, to do your job on the best way. 
So uh, it's not something new. Uh, clients are eager to hire candidates from still to hire candidates from Ukraine because they receive the decent quality for decent price. And that's something which we can be like really exposed to the world. Everybody knows the quality of Ukrainian developers. Uh, with uh, in, back in 2014, when uh, Crimea was annexed, we had this breakthrough when a lot of uh, Ukrainian-based companies or some companies which had R&D offices in but, Ukraine. But uh, does a balance between the risk of the country uh, which faced this war and the professionalism of Ukrainian IT specialists? It, How do they do it? Uh, even before war started, like officially on the February, there was a huge number of uh, specialists in each company in Ukraine, which were creating the plan B in terms of relocation, in terms of escalation. So uh, the main uh, important key uh, specialists from IT departments, they were relocated in advance. Some of the American-based companies with R&D offices in Ukraine, they managed to relocate not only the key players, but also anybody who would be happy to do this movement in terms of relocation. So it's not something new as it has been done before in 2014 and they continue to do that. And okay, it's thank you. And uh, I would like to ask uh, then Oleg Derluk. Uh, I think that uh, um, some scale of your customers change it too. And maybe you see any changes in your customers' moods. Uh, do more people ask for advice on business relocation from Ukraine to abroad? Maybe some taxes abroad or some uh, uh, how to make uh, employer status, etc. Uh, how many clients do you have now from Ukraine in this case? Uh, well, to be honest, to begin with, we had very little Ukrainian clients from the very start. So we mostly deal with foreigner investors who are interested in global business services, as the colleague quoted. Uh, can you hear me well, guys, by the way? Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we hear you. We hear you good. Very good, very good. Well, uh, answering the question relating to the mood of the clients, uh, whom we deal with, with whom we deal. Uh, what can I say that they are really impressed with the courage that uh, we show when we fight off the aggression. Uh, everyone believed there that we wouldn't last longer for three, longer than three days, but we did and we do now. Uh, I don't really think that they are concerned with the risks related to the mobilization of staff who wouldn't be able to handle the desk. I think we are a little bit overthinking the problem here. Uh, what they do like in us is that the courage uh, and our willingness to deliver the job because, well, Ukraine was always like that. We have very different living conditions. We have very different uh, culture uh, comparing to the West. And uh, they know that in Ukrainian IT industry is like a football in Brazil. So basically there are no other way. And uh, our character and the situations that we have, they understand that it pushes our specialists uh, to their maximum. So we deliver at best. Because we have a war, we need to feed our families, we need to protect ourselves, we need to help the army, we need to fight. So this is what uh, must be um, some like an insurance for foreign investors and then again uh, talking about the relocation as a general fact uh, if ukrainian company i mean a ukrainian it company has a ukrainian legal person to receive profits very probably uh, this company wouldn't last long in ukraine risks are multiple war only adds up so all the it companies whom i know who have survived everyone have is are using the interest the global infrastructure not the limited confined ukrainian banking system not the limited ukrainian infrastructure but the global one 
because otherwise the economy would, well, we cannot otherwise deal internationally in uh, selling our products and so on. So Ukrainian banking system is not a risk because nobody uses it. Only the employees use it when they need to spend something or- you Yes, know, but I've... it is two, 200,000 people in Ukraine, maybe more. 200,000 200, people in Ukrainian IT industry. Yeah. And I think it is small. That yes, the use they, that... yeah. they don't go to the office. They work remotely. Everything started since COVID. All the major players have internationally dispersed teams when like in one team, you might have people who are all over the world who are not sitting in the same room. This time has passed long ago and uh, so you are you are optimist too as i can see i'm an optimist. and uh, no, I'm, I'm, a realist. I'm a realist i'm a realist i see that there has been no harm done only the buildings were uh, destroyed but the buildings are well they were empty everybody was working from home uh what uh, is the problem which is very frequently overlooked here is the discipline because when people start to work remotely they start to get like um, how do i put More it flexible no 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 they take another job or a third one for example uh -huh. it's very hard to keep track of them and basically this is uh, uh, the new service uh, which the clients are looking for they ask how to how can we legally agree with uh, an employee on how to track his progress and how to check that he is really working. Uh, Non-solicit, uh, non-compete in Ukraine have always been a problem and DSCT is a joke in this regard. So uh, this is what they ask for. Uh, and in term, uh, as for the physical relocation, uh, most of the companies which we consider Ukrainian IT companies, but in fact, I would call them uh, IT companies of Ukrainian origin, for example, very much uh, or similar uh, in size uh, players, they all have moved outside of Ukraine long time ago and their offices are mostly in Cyprus, Malta. So on, only some recruitment, only some the most basic facilities are still in Ukraine. Sometimes the customers are still in Ukraine. But most of the IT companies I deal with, they tend only to have some um, small connection to Ukraine in terms of infrastructure. So they, but they, none they, uh, none uh, in terms of clients. None in terms of clients. Nobody sells in Ukraine because, well, people wouldn't you, buy. They sell from Ukraine. No, not from Ukraine. They sell. Somewhere. Well, it depends on the product, for example. Well, usually if we talk European Union, then, for example, a Cypriot company in terms of digitalized economy, it can buy in, in China and sell in France without having any, without heavy, having any, so let's call it uh, jokingly, substantial presence in, in France, you see. Okay, let's let me continue with the, another question to you and for our another speakers too. About challenges, should be Ukrainian IT business be prepared for in the near future? If mobilization is not a big what deal, is and what is coming? Well, yes. um, I would I would rather not call it the challenges, but I would uh, rather call it an opportunity. Well, how I see the IT industry globally, I would say that every deal has its niche in terms of uh, personal, in terms of employees. So the IT services, which are provided in six countries, for example, they are, they are similar because we have um, had a very um, similar uh, educational system, yes. uh, a priority system, very strong mathematics system, very weak humanitarian system in terms of, I mean, management and everything, but good mathematicians, good technicians, good engineers, um, and plus the culture. Well, we saw the, well, we share some of the culture, all right? Nobody will buy from Russia. 
Nobody will buy from Belarus now. Yes. Nobody will buy from Kazakhstan. So we do, we do not have many competitors. Moldavian uh, IT industry is scarce. Uh, so it is our opportunity. Let's uh, let's pass the question to Andrew. Andrew, what do you think about this? Uh, Sorry, I, I think I just need to disagree with some of the statements that uh, have been made because uh, it seems like we are talking about um, the Ukrainian IT sector, which in, in fact is non-existent because nobody is buying from Ukraine. Everybody is buying from around the world from different companies, from different countries. And then we're comparing uh, the Ukrainian sector with Moldova, with Kazakhstan with, and with other people, with other uh, countries. It seems to me a bit of, uh, you know, a, you, a bit chaotic. Uh, yeah, let, let, me just thin, let me just uh, finish the thought. Also, you know, maybe one point that I need to make uh, very, very directly and, 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 and precisely, I am a huge advocate of the Ukrainian IT sector. And uh, since the beginning of the war, or actually even before that, because the first chat that I had about the Ukrainian IT sector was back in January, when the escalation or the invasion, I should say, uh, had not even taken place. And I remember uh, talking to international media outlets about uh, contingency plans that uh, Ukrainian companies had um, in uh, implemented long time before. So, so that's, let's, let's just make this, this clear that I am uh, an advocate. At the same time, I am also hearing from a lot of different people, uh, and, and maybe re referring to what Oleg uh, said earlier, that uh, you know, uh, companies around the world see that it just works. No, it's not like that. Uh, because a, a regular company has, uh, looks at risks. And if it just works, it's not enough for them because a lot of those companies cannot afford to have a situation that it just works. It has to work very well and they cannot lose money because anything that they pay for, this is losing money. So they have to be more than 100% uh, uh, sure. I think, uh, I think we, are, uh, we are talking about a, a number of different things here. Uh, I think we, we need to uh, have some sort of focus. We, are, we do have a sector in Ukraine, an IT sector in Ukraine. And if someone disagrees with that, uh, that's, not, uh, that's definitely not, a, not a, a, a true case because there is an, an existing and a growing IT sector in Ukraine. The fact that uh, a lot of companies have uh, been registered in a number of different uh, geographies for a very long time. It doesn't uh, mean that they are not Ukrainian. Uh, at the same time, I can see that if you if you look at the IAOP uh, top outsourcers list, you will see that seven out of in the most recent one published in February, seven out of a hundred companies are actually headquartered in Ukraine. Uh, they are still headquartered in Ukraine. And another, I believe, three or four have major delivery centers in Ukraine. So, uh, so I think what we, what we have to look into is, first of all, any legal issues that might be an issue right now. So anything related to uh, privacy, to cyber, that has to be uh, fixed. Anything related to talent. So the things that I mentioned before, being able to go out and, and, and come back to the country uh, as um, it is required by contract and by, by contracts and, and other things. And, and also uh, making sure that there is uh, talent in Ukraine. So anything that can, any legal incentives that can help uh, Ukrainians come back and discourage foreign companies to hire Ukrainians, to keep Ukrainian uh, talent within Ukrainian companies, that is something that has to be uh, looked into. And I think we're also looking at, because you know, uh, normally, if you are uh, outside uh, or in any country within the EU for more than 180 days, you technically become a tax resident in that country. That's the law. So I think we need to think, and maybe the government again should look into that issue, what to do to make sure that the, the taxes are actually still going, and I'm talking about PIT, the personal income tax, 
is still going to uh, to Ukraine as opposed to those countries where the uh, Andrea, national, Andrea, nationals are located. Andrea, and I need to interrupt you because uh, our time is, is going. And the, to address a question to Oleg uh, Malski. Oleg, uh, uh, what is your opinion on this case? Uh, because uh, uh, as a partner of company uh, which uh, make, make uh, m and uh, maybe you know uh, the point of, maybe you have the point of view on this case uh, as, uh, as big business can, can help. Because, uh, for example, in that case with Preply or with uh, Miratech, we can see that uh, the announcement and the news was that it was Ukrainian company and it, it was in Ukrainian case. Because our discussion now is that IT industry is not Ukrainian IT industry, but part of global. But I would like to make us back because we have our government, we have our tax, taxes, et cetera. And the, maybe you can uh, show us another point of view on, on this case, please. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that uh, what Andrew was saying is, is, is very uh, reasonable. I think that we, we have not, um, we have to make everything not to miss the window, but um, uh, truly from my discussions with many, um, uh, many IT specialists uh, who were able to go out, set up an office, relocate, um, Actually, many many of them are, are very much willing to go back, <laughs> um, and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's surprisingly that you know home is home, and especially if you experience uh, living in the West, living outside for quite some time, a year, let's say, um, you know you've seen it all, you've tried it all, and actually at the end of the day, you want to go back even more. So I think that uh, freedom of movement is important. I think it is important. Whether it's a risk or an opportunity, it's a good question. But I think that in any case, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like water. It finds its ways. So I think even now uh, we see more and more people getting all kinds of permits to go back and forth to do business. And everybody is starting to get worried about the, the, the tax residents. That's absolutely true. Um, there are some countries who said, well, look, since you are a forcefully displaced person, and you never moved uh, voluntarily to uh, to the EU or to any other country. Um, uh, the tax residents should not apply to you after hundred. Okay. Uh, okay. But, My, maybe but there's no clear position about that. So, um, yeah. Uh, maybe it is. Uh bad idea but it's my idea <laughs> to talk with uh, our government to to pass this uh, idea to them uh, for example to discuss the tax uh, services uh, with uh, foreign countries and to leave taxes in ukraine because mm -hmm. uh, for example uh, uh, my company faced uh, with the same situation we would like to pay taxes in ukraine and help our country but we need to change our tax residence if we are abroad more than 118 uh, days. So, uh, okay, and the, if, uh, if it is a good idea, let's, let's, we have two minutes more. Let me ask Vlada. Uh, Vlada, what do you think about the, uh, the remotely work and about that opportunity? What about your clients like employees? Uh, if they will, be, uh, will agree uh, to pay taxes in Ukraine, or maybe they, they could have financial plans to stay abroad and to become not only tax residents, but full residents of that, that countries, and they would not like to pay taxes in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. It, it depends on, first of all, half of our clients who've done and established uh, like legal entities in Ukraine, they are currently working on establishing legal entities in European European Union. Uh, from the other perspective, there is also some uh, services, some kind of like WISE or Revolut, which uh, allow you to receive money so you are not paying any kind of taxes. But from my perspective, uh, we do continue pay taxes in Ukraine because we want to support uh, our government, our country, and there is 
th this is our conscious decision. So we made it on purpose and we do continue to do that. The same goes to a lot of a huge number of uh, candidates who are were forced to move to other countries and also to those who are still in Ukraine. They continue to pay. And the only thing which I think we need to fix is, is the currency exchange rate. Because currently, employees who do receive uh, their salary, for example, in dollars, it's automatically transferred into grievance and they're losing a huge sum of money. For example, for uh, like junior or middle developers, it's, it's, it's a huge sum. So we need to do something with that. This is really important. And now I see the trend that uh, people, they do their job, they do it really good. And in the end of the day, they are underpaid. So there is some like scene uh, and thoughts which should be done in this direction because otherwise these people will uh, quit like receiving money as the private entrepreneurs, which is kind of popular in Ukraine. And they will uh, try to find any other opportunities to receive money because they just don't want to lose it. Because okay, but, but, uh, but what I hear now is that uh, uh, you also is uh, optimistic about the situation because if you if you see a huge uh, amount of IT specialists who would like to leave taxes in Ukraine, it is good good news for us. And maybe we should uh, continue our discussion with our government how to do it, which uh, tools or which opportunities we should have, and to discuss with them. And uh, guys, thank you a lot uh, for our discussion, and uh, I hope to see you again for for some discussion with our government too. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank great you, day. Thank you. Yeah. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.